I'm Kyle Wathan. Welcome back to my series on simulating adaptive clinical trials, where to start, and how to expand. I hope you enjoyed the last video and found it informative. If you have not already subscribed to the channel, please consider subscribing so that you can receive notifications when new videos are uploaded. In this video, we'll have our first hands-on looking into the R code. We'll begin with the GitHub repository where you can download all of the code for this series. I'm a big fan of active learning. I like to have people participate in what they're doing. I think that it helps them learn much more effectively. So I've provided a start template folder that gives you R code with comments and some very simple pseudocode so you know how to begin and expand the code from there. I also provide a final solutions folder for each example so that you have a fully worked and running code at the end. We'll also look at the programming conventions. These are how I name variables and files throughout this course. This will help understand how the code is written and where to find things. We're going to look at RStudio basics. These are some shortcuts that I routinely use to improve my productivity and I hope that you'll find them helpful. We're going to jump right into the R code, walk through the template so that you know what it what is there and what is expected. Then we'll actually pause, give you an opportunity to work on the code, and then we can come back and compare it to the final solution. Then from that point, we'll be getting it ready to go to where we can expand from there. Remember, this video is just the beginning part where we'll have a very simple trial. In the future videos, we'll be expanding to do all of the adaptions that we want. In the video description, you'll find a link to the GitHub repository that has all the code for this series. If you're familiar with source control, you can simply use the clone button. This will download the entire repository so that you can simply pull to get any updates as we move through the series. If you're not familiar with source control, GitHub does provide a facility in which you can just click the download and you can get it as a zip file. You can then extract all of the files from there. The major disadvantage to this is that as updates are pushed to this repository, it'll be difficult for you to get them. So if you're not familiar with source control but are interested, in the programming conventions document, the very, the very top, there is an introduction to GitHub and gives several links to how to get used to using Git. In the remainder of this video, we're going to be focused on example one. We'll go into to example one, starting in the start template folder, and from there, we'll look at the code and begin putting the building blocks together for the fully adaptive trial that we're trying to get to. As a reminder, in this example, we're going to simulate a fixed sample clinical trial. This means that the analysis will only be conducted at the end of the study. We will assume two treatments, standard of care S and the experimental arm E. We will assume a Bayesian beta binomial model for calculating the probability that one treatment is better than the other. We will select the treatment if there is greater than a 90% chance that it is better than the other treatment. This approach could be done in a very simple fashion. See, for example, simpleapproach.r for the complete solution. This approach would be sufficient if we did not want to do any kind of adaptive design. If we tried to take the code in simpleapproach.r and expand it to meet the fully adaptive randomization that we are planning on doing, this type of code would result in error-prone code and would likely be difficult to extend. We are going to begin in the R code. We'll start with simpleapproach.r. Note that we are starting in the start template folder. This, in this part of the solution, we only have outline with a little bit of the code that we are going to do. This will allow us to pause and give you an opportunity to develop the code on your own and then compare to the solution provided at the end of this video. We will begin with RStudio and a few basic tricks that I like to use. For example, there is an outline button found here that if you click on it, it will show an outline of the file that you are looking at. This can be very useful for navigating through the R code and finding exactly what you're looking for. 
In the template, I've provided an outline, and for each place where code needs to be added, there's an add code to define parameters, or an add code to define cutoffs. These comments are used to guide you so that you know where to actually add code. A couple other things that are of interest in RStudio so that when I'm moving around, you'll understand how I'm doing it. For example, if you highlight a variable and then scroll down through the R code, you'll notice that like here, the variable is highlighted. This makes it very useful for looking where else you've used variables and can quickly find them. One other opportunity that I like to use or, or shortcut that I like to do is if you click on a function name and press F2, it jumps to the definition for that function. This can be very useful when you're developing multi-file solutions. Another useful tool in our studio is the code folding. This can be done by clicking the arrows over on the left hand side. Notice when you press it once it hides code. You get an indicator that code is hidden by this. You can click it again to expand it. This becomes useful when you need to look at when you want to hide big blocks of code. This is often useful if you have very long files, though I do not recommend developing with long files. At the top of each of the R files, there's going to be a description saying what the file will do. Okay, now jumping right into the code. At the beginning, you'll notice that I have a remove list equals ls. What this does is it clears out the environmental variable. It's a very good practice to have this so that you do not accidentally use variables that you previously defined. What we would like to do is to, to define a few of the variables to give you a starting point in this template with where to go. So we're going to make the assumption that the n max quantity of patients is going to be 200. I try to use descriptive names, but not to be overly long in length so that you have to type. One of the conventions that I use is I always like to have prefixes at the beginning of every variable name. For example, this one I began with an n because I expect the number of patients in a trial to be an integer value. This helps when I'm reading the code to know what a variable type is. As you're going through the code, you'll notice that there are places where I've put comments as to what I would like to do. So for example, I'm going to start at the add code here to define parameters. This is, would be a good place to add your prior parameters. Notice that I've put, in a, put a comment above so that the prior response rate for s would be defined as a beta 0.2.8. Prefix the variable, say for example, d prior a for s being the a parameter in the beta distribution would get 0 0.2 d prior b for s could get a 0 0.8 you would need to continue doing this to define the prior parameters for E as well. The reason I like to use variables rather than hard-coded values later in the code is it makes it much easier to change and to try different things. As you scroll down through the code, you'll see where I've left several comments, such as we're going to define the decision criteria and then a comment as to what you should add here. Note that there are many ways that this could actually be done. The way that I'm walking through this is only one possible solution. When you're thinking about it, putting variables in, such as defining the cutoff for the probability to make a decision, makes it much easier to try different things and new values. If you don't like the design, change the parameter and redo it. If you actually had hard-coded those values into the code and it was in multiple places, you could end up with a design that you're really not sure what it's actually doing. So it's usually best to define things in variable names and have code blocks describing what they are. As you scroll through, so we've, after we've defined the parameters for the prior, the next thing that we would want to do is set up our simulation parameters. The simulation parameters would be things such as your true response rate for S, your true response rate for E, and the number of virtual trials that you'd like to simulate. 
Typically, I like to simulate at least a thousand virtual trials before providing any average behavior. Although, depending on the, the case, I may do as many as 10,000 or 100,000 virtual trials. This provides a more precise estimate. Notice that I've given some example code. This is useful for, for being able to simulate the data and understand a simple way of doing it. Again, as you go down, there is a way that you can, there is a spot that indicates what you would want to add here. For example, here you would want to add code for simulating the response. As you finish scrolling down, there will be more places through here where you're going to go through the simulated trials and collect your results. Note that I've already put an idea here, which is you want to calculate the probability that S is greater than E, or the probability that E is greater than S, but note that I do not have that function filled out. I've given a couple hints as to how to calculate that. You could do it by simulating from both of the, prior, the posterior distributions, or you could compute this for integration by integration in this case. Most of the Bayesian models don't allow for the integration, and you actually have to do MCMC. But for this simple case, integration would be sufficient and would actually be quicker than sampling the two posterior distributions. At this point, we're going to continue scrolling down to the very last section. Note, rather than continuing to scroll, I could come over and click on the shortcuts on the right hand of the, where you have the outline of the document. This jumps me to exactly where I'd like to be in the document. Note that towards the end, what we're looking for is to be able to print out the operating characteristics such as the probability that we've selected S, probability that we've selected E, and the probability that we have not selected a treatment at all. At this point, I would suggest pausing the video, trying to come up with a solution on your own, and then return to the video, and we will be going through the solution in the next half of this video. Thank you and good luck. If you have any questions, please post questions or comments in the description below and I'll try to respond as quick as I can. Welcome back. How did you do? Were you able to complete the coding challenge and simulate the fixed sample trial? If not, we're about to go through the template file and add the necessary code based on the comment. Okay, we're back in our studio and we're going to start at the, at the top of the file where we have comments based on the document outline on the right. Earlier, I went through and showed how we were adding comments to each of these sections. We're going to start at the top by clicking on the Add Code here. At this point, we need to be able to add code for calculating the probability that x1 is greater than x2. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this method by integration, one of the hints that was suggested. So we're going to use the built-in integrate function in R. But in order to do this, we need to know the function that we're integrating. Note that this is a straightforward calculation based on two beta distributions. Please refer to the PDFs to be able to see how the function was created. This would now give us a function that could calculate the probability that E is greater than S or the probability that S is greater than E based on the input parameters. So, for example, if we wanted to calculate the probability that E is greater than S, we would simply use the experimental parameters first and the standard of care S parameters second. This would then return the probability that E is greater than S, which we use in our decision making. Going over to the document outline, if you go down, there is another point where we have to add code. So we're going to click on that. And at this point, we're going to dis define the, the parameters needed for the cutoffs and the simulation parameters and the priors. So we're going to start adding these in. And note, there are no, these, these do not line up. And if you were comparing to the previous ones, things are not lining up. I'm very specific about trying to get things to line up. So we're going to go ahead and make the code neat so that it's easier to read. At the end, I always like to have code that reads much more like a book rather than actual code. 
Now we'll go down to the next place where we need to add code. And this is the place where we need to add the cutoffs for decision making. Note, as I'm going through, I'm deleting the add code comments so that when we get finished, we know that we're actually done and don't have any more places that we need to add code. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and jump down to the part where we're going to define the parameters for simulation. Things that we need to be able to simulate are the true response rates for S, the true response rate for E, and the number of virtual trials. For this example, we're going to simulate a thousand virtual trials where the true response rates for S is 0.2 and the response rate for E is 0.4. This would be analogous to an alternative hypothesis where you're trying to compare 0.2 versus 0.4. In most simulations, you would like to do more than just one scenario, so you would use this code repeatedly to do different scenarios or different hypothetical values for the response rate for E. Okay, going back to the code document, we're going to jump down to the next piece. We're going to go ahead and add the code. Okay, note that in this section, we're going to use the R binome, which simulates binomial variables based on the n for e and the n for s that were simulated above. It also utilizes the true response rates for e and the true response rate for s. Note that all we're doing is simulating the n quantity of reps. This is the number of virtual trials that we wanted. So we'll end up at the end of this piece of code with 1,000 number of responses for e and 1,000 response numbers for s. Okay, going down the code, continuing, we've got a few more add code sections, so we're going to jump down. And at this point, we need to add, some, add the code so that we can um, track things and be able to calculate the posterior probabilities. Note that in this one, it's very easy to update the posterior parameters because they're simply taking the prior A, adding the number of responses, the prior B, B in the beta distribution and adding the number of non-responders, or as noted here, the number of fails on S and E respectively. What we are doing here is we're forming four vectors to have the posterior parameters for S and E respectively. This makes it very easy to, to loop through the 1,000 simulated trials and calculate the probability that E is greater than S, which is what we need for decision making. We're going to go back to the outline on document on the right, and we see that we have three more sections that we still need to add code for. So we're going to go ahead and skip down to the next one. And now what we're doing is we've already gone through and we've looped through the trials up at the in the loop, the for loop above. We've calculated the probability that E is greater than S, and now we simply need to summarize the data or the operating characteristics based on this. So this section down here, what we're doing is we're calculating the, the likelihood that the probability that E is greater than S is above the cutoff value of DPU. We'll also calculate the probability for selecting S and no treatment the same way. The last thing we need to do is to add the print statements to summarize the operating characteristics and calculate the average number of patients on S and E. Note that in this example, we did equal randomization. We're not doing a block randomization, so there's no guarantee that we'll end up with half the patients on S or half the patients on E. But I would leave this as a challenge. What would you need to do to modify the code such that it would be block randomization rather than equal randomization? I hope that you found this video very helpful and will continue to watch the remaining videos. In the next one, we will actually be looking at how to take this example and create functions for each of the tasks that were there. This will make it much easier to expand in the future videos and sections of this course. Remember, if you have not subscribed, please consider subscribing so that you'll receive updates when new videos are posted. Good luck and see you next time.